Good morning. This is Northern Light for Tuesday, June 27th. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. A group of forest rangers from New York have spent the last two weeks helping fight wildfires in Canada. The opportunity to go up and have a direct, however big or small, effect on this situation was it was really a, a privilege I couldn't pass up on. Former Lieutenant Governor Richard Ravitch has died. He was instrumental in pulling New York City out of bankruptcy in the 1970s. Also, we'll listen back to our conversation with Chris Woodward about the grind of building Adirondack guideboats. It's tedious work. I mean, it's dusty, dirty work. As, as Ralph Morrow, one of the guys at Tommy, work is work. He says, it doesn't matter if you're building a boat or digging a ditch. Work is work. And our area farm stands are opening up with strawberries and asparagus. And we'll pay a visit to the stand at J&W Orchard in Norfolk to check out the rhubarb. All of that and more is coming up on Northern Light. Stick with us. Broadcast of Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio is supported by Adirondack Foundation and the Adirondack Birth to Three Alliance, dedicated to providing all children the best possible start in life, adirondackbt3.org. And by Long Run Wealth, an SEC-registered investment advisor in Lake Placid, providing comprehensive wealth management, retirement, and financial planning solutions, longrunwealth.com. This is Northern Light. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. Smoke from Canadian wildfires returned to the North Country on Sunday, creating unhealthy air conditions. It's been a massive effort to fight the hundreds of wildfires burning in Ontario and Quebec. Forest rangers from New York have been part of that effort. Emily Russell has details. In early June, just when the North Country was blanketed in heavy, unhealthy smoke from Canadian wildfires, a group of New York State forest rangers drove north towards those fires. Ranger Rob Projackalo, who works in the Adirondacks, said conditions up there were ripe for wildfires. It was 90 degrees and 10 to 15 mile an hour winds every day. Over the span of two weeks, the rangers worked on four wildfires in Quebec. They set up water pumps and lakes, dragged hoses through the forests, did what they could to dampen the blazes. Bajakalo and other rangers spoke on a call with reporters on Monday. He said seeing the scale of one of the fires from a helicopter was unbelievable. It's like flying from Lake Placid to, to Lake Clear and everything in between is burned. And there's burned out camps and cottages. Wildfires across Canada have displaced tens of thousands of people. The country has experienced extreme heat and drought conditions due to climate change. Officials say Canada is on track to have the worst wildfire season on record. This is the most extreme fire behavior I've ever seen. That's Ranger Anastasia Alwine, who covers the Catskills. She was one of eight rangers working up in Canada. It was Alwine's first time fighting a wildfire outside of New York State. And they always tell you, like, a large fire front sounds like a freight train. And just the smaller scale, the sound of it was extremely dramatic. And the speed at which it went was also dramatic. Alwine described one of the fires as a massive wall of flames that created a huge column of smoke. Alwine said she felt called to go to Canada to help. You know, you hear about a lot of things happening in other countries that cause concern for you, but you can't directly affect. So having the opportunity to go up and have a direct, however big or small, effect on this situation was was really a, a privilege I couldn't pass up on. The Rangers returned to New York last weekend. Wildfires are still raging in Canada. Rob Projackalo said there were reminders of those fires on his drive back home to the Adirondacks. Between Ottawa and Montreal, there was still very heavy smoke. The sun was orange in the sky. Forecasts show smoke from the Canadian wildfires will continue to plague the East Coast and Midwest all this week. Emily Russell, North Country Public Radio. A 
former lieutenant governor of New York and chair of the MTA subway system has died at the age of 89. Richard Ravitch was known as the hero of New York City's 1970s financial crisis. Karen DeWitt brings us his story. Ravitch, born in Manhattan in 1933, was the grandson of Jewish immigrants from Russia. His father ran a construction company which built some notable New York City landmarks, including a former site of the Whitney Museum and New York University Hospital. His mother was a sculptor. After graduating from Columbia Law School, Ravitch focused on building low- and middle-income housing, and he was drawn into politics, where he espoused liberal views and the tradition of FDR. Former Governor Hugh Carey appointed him to a key post where he helped pull New York City out of bankruptcy in 1975. Ravitch described how he did that in a 2010 interview with This American Life. Ravitch, who devised a means for the city to raise short-term cash to pay its bills, told how Ira Glass that Kerry asked him to intervene when the then president of the teachers union, Albert Shanker, said his union would not invest $150 million in municipal bonds that were needed to keep New York afloat. Ravitch, who was friendly with Shanker, convinced him to change his mind. I met Al in his apartment at 1130 at night. I said to Al, I understood his reluctance, that I respected his dilemma. On the other hand, this is one of those unique circumstances in life where you, the consequences of going into bankruptcy was so disastrous that you had to take some risks. By the next day, Shanker asked for a private meeting with Ravitch and Governor Carey, as Glass explains. So Ravitch and the governor and some others meet Shanker at Ravitch's apartment. The beds aren't made, there's barely anything to eat. Ravage puts out some matzah. And finally, they convince Shanker that really his back is against the wall, all of theirs is. And yes, the bonds are risky, but if New York defaults, all the city contracts will become invalid, including the teachers' union contract, which of course will be awful for Shanker and his union. And Shanker reluctantly buys the bonds, and New York City is saved. Ravitch then ran the MTA for a while and is credited with saving it. He later worked for Major League Baseball. In 2009, at a time when many people might think of retiring, Ravitch accepted the appointment to lieutenant governor by then-governor David Patterson. Patterson says he helped avoid a state constitutional crisis. I thought that the best public policy was to go out and find the best person that I could think of who could govern in my absence, and that person is Richard Ravitch. Patterson, who was lieutenant governor, became governor when Elliot Spitzer resigned, leaving the lieutenant governor's position vacant. In those circumstances, the leader of the state Senate serves as lieutenant governor. But the Senate was in disarray after a faction rebelled, and its leadership was in dispute. There are two, if not three, senators that lay claim to that post. When Ravitch's and Patterson's term ended, neither sought election to their post. In the years after, Ravitch wrote a memoir, and he served as co-chair on a state budget crisis task force with former Federal Reserve Chair Paul Volcker. Many leading political figures and civic organizations expressed condolences. Governor Kathy Hochul, who was herself a lieutenant governor, says Ravitch was a titan of New York's civic world who left an indelible mark on our state. She says he will be greatly missed. He became a good friend and advisor of mine. We had lunch together not that long ago. He told me all the things I need to do, as he always would. Ravitch is survived by two former wives, Diane Ravitch, an influential voice in education policy, and Betsy Perry, and his current wife, Kathleen Doyle, as well as two sons. In Albany, I'm Karen DeWitt. You're listening to Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. It's nine minutes past eight. Good morning. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandreski. Just ahead, we'll head to the workshop of Adirondack guideboat builder Chris Woodward and listen to some music that he inspired. It's coming up in just a few minutes here on Northern Light.
Music by Patricia Julian out of Burlington. Listen to more of regional musicians on our website, part of our Underscore Project. Check out Patricia Julian and more at ncpr.org slash underscore. Northern Light is supported by Adirondack Land Trust, working with communities to protect trails and open spaces for the benefit of all. AdirondackLandTrust.org. And Citizen Advocates, offering the North Country mental health, addiction, and housing services, plus crisis care, job training, and more. CitizenAdvocates.net slash 124. June means the season's first strawberries and asparagus and the opening of lots of of side-of-the-road summer food stands. They're all over the North Country, and you've probably got a few in your neighborhood selling seasonal produce, eggs, and honey. Amy Fireeyes will stop by the stand at J&W Orchard in Norfolk, where one of the owners was picking fresh rhubarb for sauce and pies. Here's her audio postcard. It's one of those beautiful, clear, and slightly windy days when I pull off the side of Route 38. I stopped because of a big, hand-painted sign promising rhubarb. In front of me is a house and acres of immaculate gardens and fruit trees. We got 33 varieties of uh, apples, three different varieties of pears, four different varieties of plums. That's the woman behind it all. She grew up on this land. I'm Angie Conger. My father used to own this and I took over. He passed away in 15. So I'm trying to keep the tradition. J and W stands for Jean and Walt, Conger's parents. Jean still lives here. Conger cares for her and the farm. I'm the only kid out of six kids that's around this area. So I got the job. <laughs> This early in the season, there's really one crop in the garage-turned-farm stand. Big, freshly cut bags of rhubarb. I have people coming all the time from all over. I had one person come from Russell and bought four, four bags of them, and each bag has two pounds in it. We're in the rhubarb patch, a meticulously tidy raised bed, bursting with rhubarb stalks and leaves. Some of them have to be picked. <laughs> In the beginning of the spring, they're so big. Conger is filling a wicker basket with rhubarb stalks that have leaves the size of toddlers. But these, she says, aren't big, big. And then because I have so many people coming, they don't have time to get big. (laughs) Big, big. They're still big, but... And some people say they like them better small because they're more tender. Conger's favorite way to cook rhubarb is in a pie with strawberries. She says her father's rhubarb patch was much smaller than this one. She's been growing it the last few years. Started with maybe a six foot, and then then we divided them up and spread it out. Well, we actually went this way, and then that way, and then last year we did that one. Now it's about 100 feet of rhubarb plants surrounded by clean straw. Conger says she gets her compulsive neat streak from her dad. It's like my my father was that way. Well, you got to get it right the first time or you got redo. <laughs> when I leave Conger, she's sitting in the grass in a pool of sunlight. I am cutting the ends off and then I'll be going in and bagging it up. <laughs> when that sells out in a few hours, she'll be back out here harvesting more. In Norfolk at J&W Orchard, I'm Amy Fireisel for North Country Public Radio. Check out pictures of Angie Conger and her rhubarb patch in the online story at ncpr.org. All trains between Albany and Montreal have been canceled this week due to heat restrictions in Canada. The Adirondack Rail Line connects the two cities with stops throughout the North Country, including in Whitehall, Westport and Plattsburgh. Amtrak announced the suspension of service last Friday, citing excessive heat restrictions along the route. Service along the Adirondack Rail Line between Albany and Montreal was suspended for three years during the pandemic and had just resumed in April. As of late Monday, the Amtrak website allows bookings on the Adirondack Line beginning this Sunday, July 2nd. 
It's unclear what the future holds for some of the pickleball courts in Saranac Lake. The mayor and village board are debating whether to remove the tennis and pickleball courts and turn the area on Lake Flower into a park and picnic area. According to the Adirondack Daily Enterprise, the board is concerned that they could miss out on funding for a park redesign if they don't get rid of the courts. In response to this development, pickleball enthusiasts from Saranac Lake and the surrounding area have rallied together and signed a petition in support of the pickleball court. Saranac Lake Mayor Jimmy Williams voted against the plan to redesign the park and is urging the board to reconsider getting rid of those pickleball courts. Plattsburgh angler Brett Carnwright won first place in this year's fishing tournament. According to the Plattsburgh Press Republican, the tournament hosts more than 200 anglers from 41 different states at the Plattsburgh Marina. Carnwright is the first local to ever win a major tournament on the lake. His cousin, Ryan Lattenville, took second place. The two have been fishing Lake Champlain since they were kids. Carnwright's haul weighed close to 60 pounds, and he took home a prize of You're listening to Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandresky. Coming up in just a minute, we'll head to the workshop of Adirondack guideboat builder Chris Woodward. Then stick around after the show for Bird Note, how yellow warblers are particularly vulnerable to environmental shifts. That's just ahead at 842. But first, Todd has a look at the weather for us. Clouds and showers again today. Scattered rain in the forecast. Highs this afternoon in the upper 70s, near 80. Uh, The Weather Service says about a 75% chance of showers today and tonight. Lows in the 60s overnight tonight. Tomorrow it's going to be cooler with a high in the low 70s. Light winds out of the southwest. And what the Weather Service predicts to be numerous showers on Wednesday. Highs Again, near 70, uh, 60% chance of rain tomorrow, 30% chance of scattered showers Thursday, mid-70s for highs, and Friday, partly cloudy, a high in the low 80s. Right now, we have mostly cloudy skies, 69 degrees here in Canton. The Adirondack guideboat is a very particular craft. It's a wooden boat, wider than a canoe, and rowed instead of paddled. They were the boat of choice for professional guides in the Adirondacks in the 18th and 19th centuries. Very few people still build and repair guideboats. Chris Woodward in Saranac Lake is one of those people. Amy Fire Rizal spoke with him a few years ago, and here's the story. For over 30 years, Chris Woodward has been working on Adirondack guideboats. It sounds romantic, but Chris will be the first one to say it's anything but. It's tedious work. I mean, it's dusty, dirty work. As, as Ralph Morrow, one of the guys that taught me, work is work. He says, it doesn't matter if you're building a boat or digging a ditch. Work is work. But his work is pretty rare. It's a niche market. Chris may work on 10 boats a year. And because it's so labor-intensive, it doesn't pay very well. For Chris, the work is more like a compulsion. He grew up in the Adirondacks at Paul Smith's, and even as a kid, he was obsessed with guideboats. I figured the only way I was going to get one was to learn to build it, so I I always had an interest in it. In 1981, North Country Community College offered a class in traditional guideboat building. It was taught by veteran boat makers Ralph Morrow and Carl Hathaway. Chris, who was 22, took the course. He describes his teachers as old school. Crusty no-nonsense people that is like, this is the way it's done. You just shut up and do it and learn it. And, you know, you go on on your own. You could invent anything you want. But here, you're doing it my way. And I was cool with that. Chris was head over heels. The trouble is, Morrow and Hathaway were still working. And there were and are only so many guideboats to restore. They come from a very small pool. 
the owners of historic camps and expensive resorts. In the Adirondacks, we've always had this symbiotic relationship between the wealthy people and the locals that were the the guides and the caretakers. And the boat builders. But it was the early 80s. The Adirondacks as a vacation destination were in a bit of a slump. So Chris worked odd jobs and waited for years. His break came in 1987. He'd kept in touch with Carl Hathaway, and as Carl got older, he needed help in the shop. Chris was willing to do anything, but usually it was... Sanding. Sanding. That's 80% of boat work is sanding. People bring in boats that are over 100 years old. That's because traditional guide boats are made of wood and thousands of tiny nails and screws. No glue, no epoxy. Any part of them can be repaired and replaced. But that doesn't mean it's easy, especially boats made with iron screws. And iron screws, of course, rust when they get wet. But when they rust, they degrade the wood around it. you got to pull these iron fastenings and then put all new wood in. But in order to pull them, they, you can't just unscrew them. You have to mechanically find a way to... Uh, take them out. Imagine a burly bearded man going to war armed with a pair of pliers. After decades of this, Chris says he still hasn't found a trick. Iron screws are just hard. That's why he loves brass screws. A boat comes in and it's got rotten ribs and a bad centerboard and it's going to be a big job, but it's all brass screws. That may be a yes moment. <laughs> Four years after Chris joined Carl in the shop, he bought it from him and renamed it the Woodward Boat Shop. He's been there ever since. Chris has worked on hundreds of guideboats and assessed thousands. But because old ones can be repaired, he's only built about 20 new guideboats, usually one a year. His first tool is a shovel. Because the first thing you have to do is go out and dig up stumps, the ribs and the stems in the boat are all sawn from natural crooks of spruce stumps. From there, Chris says it's like building a house. Exact measurements, keeping things tight. Once the basic shape is achieved, the building stops and the sanding starts. You first have to sand it with fairly aggressive sandpaper just to form it. Then you have to sand it again with a finer grit of paper. And then you do it, oh, probably three or four different grits. Then once you put a finish on, if you're putting four or five coats of varnish or paint, you're hand sanding it in between coats. So you're going to sand a boat eight or nine times. This gets at why Chris has no successor lined up. The work is slow and physically hard and pays badly. Chris says to do it, you have to be really into boats and have a certain temperament. That and a spouse with a more traditional job. The way I'm able to survive is my wife's a nurse. And and I'm sure you hear this story time and time again up here. It's like you both have to work and one of them has to have have the benefits. This is Chris's full-time job. No side gigs. And he says retirement isn't in his future. I'm I'm in the Ralph Morrow retirement plan where you just work until you you can't. One, it's, it's a financial thing. And two, uh, you know, I I like it. I like the work I do. For North Country Public Radio's North Country at Work Project, I'm Amy Feierisel. You can see photos of Chris Woodward at work and historic photos of guideboat builders in the online story at ncpr.org. This story originally aired in February of 2020. And we actually have a special piece of music for Chris Woodward to share. Last fall, Potsdam-based fiddler Gretchen Kohler put together this lovely project where she interviewed North Country folk artists about their work, then wrote a fiddle tune inspired by that artist and their craft. And one of those people she interviewed was Adirondack guideboat builder Chris Woodward. So this is the piece she wrote for him, imagining a row around Sagamore Lake in one of those boats. It's called The Old Guideboat.
Minneapolis Potsdam-based fiddler Gretchen Kohler alongside Daniel Kelly on piano performing a piece called The Old Guideboat inspired by Adirondack guideboat builder Chris Woodward. You're listening to Northern Light right here on North Country Public Radio. So many events to uh, to share with you about what's going on throughout the community, including a community paddle in Canton this Friday evening. Turtles, Trees, and Terrain. It's hosted by Nature Up North. They say to join in to cool down and unwind after a summer day with an evening paddle. Spend some time exploring the Little River, learning about the surrounding forests and some turtle facts. They'll meet at the Little River Boat Launch uh, on Park Street, and you can find out more from natureupnorth.org. Yeah, and coming up on Sunday, it's the the second annual Akwesasne Art Market and Jury Show at Generations Park. It celebrates the the outstanding creative talent within the Akwesasne community, and there'll be uh, there'll be music, live music that day. Also, they'll be giving out awards in 12 categories, pottery, sculpture, beadwork, quill work, quilts, textiles, painting, and more. That's all happening. Generations Park, Akwesasne, the second annual art market and jury show. It's coming up on Sunday. That's it for Northern Light uh, for this Tuesday, June 27th. Morning Edition continues in just a couple of minutes. Then stick around for the Marketplace Morning Report coming up between 8.51 and 9 o'clock. We'll get caught up on all the morning's business news. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Mill. Thanks for listening this morning. Be well.